it looks like we're starting to see people being let into the room. Up to Hi, everybody. We're up to 72. We're going to just wait just a little bit till everybody has an opportunity to get in. Seems like we've stalled at 73, but I think we had 124 people register. So we'll wait just a little bit. But we lost our first one. We went 75 to 74. Well, back up to 75. So we'll go ahead and get started now. I don't see the number moving at all. Now, welcome everyone to the NOCCCD Budget Allocation Model Forum for 2021. Uh, today, we've got uh, a number of us that will be presenting. I'll be the moderator and actually doing part of the presentation. My name is uh, Fred Williams. I'm the Vice Chancellor of Finance and Facilities. I will have Kashmir Avias, our District Director of Fiscal Affairs, doing the bulk of the presentation related to the resource allocation model. We'll have Rodrigo uh, Garcia, the Fullerton College Vice President of Administrative Services, doing the presentation related to, to Fullerton College uh, allocations. Uh, Terry Cox for NOCE, she's the Director of Administrative Services, will be NOCE's uh, allocations. And Alex Porter, the Cypress College Vice President of Administrative Services, will be doing Cypress Colleges. And then I'll kind of wrap up to uh, do the, the district's uh, services all allocation. So just a little bit on the housekeeping. We did turn and off the chat feature. But we are asking if any of you have any questions. And this will be a much more interesting uh, presentation if you guys all ask questions. So if you submit questions through the Q&A, we will attempt to either answer those questions online or we will provide a written a written response. Even if we don't have time to get to all of them, we will continue to answer all of the questions and we do plan to post this, this presentation as well as kind of the details in, in terms of all of the questions that come up on, on, our, on the website. So this is being recorded. So uh, if you didn't get enough the first time, you can watch it again. If you have friends that might that you think might be interested or coworkers, uh, we will be having this posted on the district website so they'll be able to, to, to kind of catch up. So why are we doing this forum? I think that's kind of an important piece of information for us. Uh, it is included in all our planning documents that we will annually get out and do a budget allocation presentation. We've done it for a number of years. Typically, we go out to each campus and do one there, but this year we decided to do something a little different with COVID. Uh, we are doing our first webinar. So if it doesn't go out perfectly, this is our first attempt of actually using Zoom and the webinar feature. So uh, we'll see kind of how that, that works. But this is an opportunity for us to be transparent and get uh, information out for all those individuals that are actually interested in how things work within the district. Kind of as a, a third uh, reason why we do this, uh, we do use this as accreditation evidence in terms of getting out and, and uh, giving information related to the budget and trying to explain how everything works. So um, next slide, Cashew. For the agenda today, we will be going over a lot of things that tie into our allocation model but maybe tied into the, to either the state or other processes. So we'll be going over the budget timelines, the state budget process, the district's budget process. We'll be talking quite a bit about the district's new internal resource allocation model. We'll be talking about other funds, uh, the allocation process at each budget center and how you can stay connected. So that's really the agenda for today and wherever else it takes us once we start to see uh, the Q&A questions coming up. So we did get a question, not surprisingly, very quick from, from Marcus. Uh, 
I will take that question actually a little bit later in terms of how will the U.S. settlements have on district and campus budgets. Uh, so we'll, we will get to that uh, question as part of the presentation. So uh, just kind of hold on uh, for that question and we'll, I'll respond to that a little bit later. So Cashew, I'm gonna kind of turn it over to you to start the, the presentation. Okay, great. And because I've got so many screens open, I'm gonna be turning off my video. So hi to everybody. I will see you all. You will see me all later. Let me start by talking about the budget process for the our fiscal year, the timeline. We're driven by the governor's timeline as well. So the budget process for the following year starts in January of the previous year. So, um, or, or starts in as early as January when the governor releases a proposed budget. So we use that proposed budget and analysis to see what we might expect for revenues in the following year. And then we develop our assumptions about our revenues and our expenditures to build the budget on. And in addition to state revenues, we'll look at local revenues. And for expenses, we then look to determine what our permanent positions will be, what FTS targets we might anticipate, what our faculty obligation number will be, and how that might impact our extended day costs. We also look to see what other operating allocations will be made. So while we're working on all this in January and in February and March and in April, the governor also is assessing the budget proposals um, in response to input from many different groups, especially the legislature. And this results in a May revise for the proposed state budget. At the same time, um, you'll see us working through a lot of different information as that comes to us. So sometimes the May revise, the community college system um, ends up with a very similar budget to the initial proposed budget. But this past year, it was very different. It's never exactly the same. So we adjust our internal budget calculations in response to funding changes in the governor's budget. Um, by May, HR provides us the projected cost for all budgeted permanent positions and the budget centers finish developing and inputting their tentative budgets, both the state and our district have a June deadline to approve a budget to start the new fiscal year. And so while that's going on, then we close the books, we have to settle up all the accounts, that information along with any updated expense data and new funding for the new year are all incorporated into the proposed budget. And we're usually required to complete that in August so that we can print and publish the proposed budget in time to take the budget to the first board meeting in September. But this year, you'll have noticed that in response to the changing fiscal information from the state, and because of the current pandemic, the deadline for our proposed budget was moved to October. But this is the general big picture budget timeline. It's driven always by information that starts from the state level and continues on from there. The governor's budget is available to anyone online to look at as soon as it's released. The governor, he has to, the governor has to react to analysis and input from various groups. Um, so as soon as the budget's released, everybody starts reacting to it. The legislature and even the public provides input. The Department of Finance will work with the governor's office on analysis on changes to the budget. And for community colleges, the state, our state chancellor's office provides a lot of analysis and information on how the budget will impact community colleges. Um, and they'll usually work with a lot of other groups that also do work and analysis on behalf of community colleges, such as the Community College League of California, the Association of Chief Business Officials, um, ACA, which consists of community college administrators, and they'll work to prepare a joint fiscal analysis. And each of these groups provide information on their on their take on their impact of the budget on and that information is available also for the public on each of their websites. So that's the state's process. Now let's talk about how the district's budget process works a little bit. There are a number of groups that receive information on the budget assumptions and also provide recommendations on certain parts of the budget as it's being developed. You may be familiar at your campuses with the various budget committees that um, provide information at the campus level, but the district-wide, uh, there's also a group there. So the budget group there is the Council on Budget and Facilities. This group consists of representatives from United Faculty and ADFAC, CSEA, Confidentials Management, as well as uh, district personnel decisions like, like um, the budget officers. So CBF, as it's known, 
receives input from its subgroups, like the budget officers group, from all the constituents, the resource allocation work group, and puts together recommendations, which then go to DCC, who then recommends to the chancellor. The chancellor takes that information, seeks whatever other information is needed, and then recommends to the board for approval. So that's generally, it's not just one person. Ultimately, it goes through that process and that flow. We do also have some policies and procedures that are in place that we follow that relate to the budget development and also management of the budget. And we also communicate the budget and the budget process in a variety of ways. So there's the budget allocation handbook, which outlines our process. This year, we're revising the handbook to reflect our new internal resource allocation model. And, but that this forum is kind of driven by having that handbook in place. We put on the forum annually to go over the model, focusing on communicating changes to the model that may result from evaluating how well it's working. This year, the discussion that we're going to have today is about our new resource allocation model as it's the first year of implementation. And Fred mentioned a little bit about accreditation. ACCJC does have a standard that speaks to evaluating and improving the use of resources. So one of the things that we've been doing these past few years, also to link budget and planning, is discussing one-time funds and trying to develop a process for their use. And also, as part of linking budget with planning, we prepare and publish the proposed budget book. So it provides information on the components of the district's overall budget. Um, let's get into our internal allocation model and then the processes at each budget center. Um, the details on the calculations we'll discuss here are included in the proposed budget book. And so as we go through this section, I've tried to include the page numbers you'll see on the presentation. I've tried to include the page numbers from the budget book for easier reference. And this entire PowerPoint presentation has been posted on the district's budget website. So if you go to nocccd.edu and go to the budget documents dash two section, you'll see it. It also can be found through the fiscal affairs section. The budget documents are available. So if you'd like to have that as well for your reference, it's available. So now we'll be getting into the district's new re internal resource allocation model. Uh, we've been calling it the RAM for some time, but just a little bit of background on this. We've been actually working on a new model since 2017, and uh, we did develop a subcommittee that kind of came up with the principles, which Tess, you will be going over shortly. And that uh, subcommittee consisted of faculty, CSCA, management, confidential, ad fact. And uh, if there's one thing, after this discussion related to the internal allocation, um, resource allocation model. The one thing I want you all to take away from this, it doesn't change the amount of revenues. It doesn't change the amount of the expenditures. They're still all the, all of the same, regardless of whether we use the old model and the new model. And, and early when we, we presented the tentative budget, we did kind of produce both models kind of side by side, but it's the same, same numbers. What we're really just showing is is showing it a little different and showing where the responsibilities are kind of uh, aligning a little different. So I think the big takeaway is while the district would always kind of hold dollars off for things like negotiations, all the dollars, and you'll see this as we go through the resource allocation model, everything is being allocated to the budget centers. And so you'll see more of the details on that. So uh, we did get another question given the student center funding fun formula. Uh, we update. So we'll be talking about this next, the, que the second question that we got from uh, Fullerton College about the new student center funding formula as part of this next section. So Keshu, why don't you go ahead and, and start off on the, the resource allocation model. Okay, thanks, Fred. So this year, as Fred said, this is, as I've said also, this year is the first year of implementation of the new internal resource allocation model or the RAM. And the district's budget assumptions are focused on ongoing operations in the general fund. And that's what's incorporated into the RAM. So the resource allocation work group started by developing these guidelines, these guiding principles, which underlie the model. These were then submitted to CBF, to DCC and to the board. The structure of the model, the RAM, defines four budget centers as well as costs that are shared district-wide. 
so the new internal model is a revenue allocation model and it starts by allocating revenues at the educational center so that's cypress fullerton and noce and then provides an allocation to district services creating a fourth budget center then all four budget centers share in the costs that are identified as district-wide. And district-wide costs are those that are that impact the entire district, like um, the pay-as-you-go cost for retiree benefits or audit costs or insurance. Um, the remaining allocations at each budget center are then available as funds for each center to cover their personnel costs and other operating costs. And this is uh, the same information verbally. Here's a summary of the allocation model components. The total estimated revenue you can see is 222.2 million. I think if I can, I think if my mouse shows up, there it is. Um, and as you can see, the net budget's equal to that amount. So we're budgeting to the revenue that's available. And let's look at those revenues. So the model includes state and local funding, and we're still primarily funded by apportionment revenues through the Student Centered Funding Formula or the SCIF, which makes up 92% of our ongoing revenues. The model also includes other state and local revenues, and they make up about 8% of our revenues that are included in our um, internal allocations. So with the overwhelming amount of our ongoing operations being funded through the state apportionment, let's talk a little bit about how the state funds community colleges. So the state funds us by formula. This pie, this lovely autumn pie, represents what the state's formula determines our apportionment should be. That's considered our earned apportionment revenue or also referred to as our total computational revenue. It's funded through a few sources, starting with enrollment fees and local property taxes collected and then provided to our district. And then those amounts are then supplemented by state revenues to get to our earned apportionment revenue. That's our pie. If we take in more enrollment fees in one year, then we get less state revenue. If enrollment fees and property taxes fall short, then the state fills the gap. But the pie doesn't get bigger. For us, the formula drives the size of the pie. However, we can lose part of the pie. If the state doesn't have enough revenue to fill in the gap, then we're left with having to deal with that deficit ourselves. For our district, the advanced estimates on revenue for the current fiscal year look like they'll be funded by 6% from our enrollment fees, but 50% from property taxes and 44% from the state revenue. So that number can change depending on what happens with, as I said, the state revenue availability. Um, now, while apportionment revenue is calculated for all districts, some districts collect enough in property taxes that they don't need the state to supplement them the same way. And they only receive state funds that are associated with specific allocations. So, but since each state or each district gets to keep its property tax revenue, they can buy more pies depending on how much extra they may get in property taxes. And those, those districts are often referred to as basic aid. Um, I mentioned that we get funded by formula but that formula has also changed over the years. We're currently dealing with the SCIF. We've dealt with other formulas in the past. And I think, Fred, could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, before we get to that, can we go back to slide 14? Because I wanted to try to address some of the questions that uh, it, it came up er earlier. So we got a question from, from Marcus about what effects will the UF settlement have on district and campus budgets? And for, I think this slide 14 kind of shows a, a perfect example of how we plan to deal with that. So you'll notice under the contingencies on this that Fullerton College District Services and NOCE had set aside dollars to cover any potential uh, UF settlement. And so Cypress College, and I'll let um, probably uh, Alex kind of talk about, he chose to do it a little bit different, but we did have the same discussion in terms of setting aside dollars to be able to cover what we thought at the time would be somewhere around a 10% increase. And so we do have money set aside for the ongoing portion that would include the agreement. And for those of you that don't know, we do have a, an item going to the board next Tuesday for a settlement. It has been ratified by faculty. And that increase, at least for the, for the first year, it's a 5.5% increase on schedule, and but it's only effective January 1, so effectively it's 2.25. So the dollars are sitting in the contingencies for really NOCE and 
uh, Fullerton College. Cypress College has set aside one-time funds to kind of cover that and we'll deal with the ongoing portion of that as we move, fo as we move forward. The one-time off-schedule bonus that was given of 10,000 per, per uh, faculty member will be coming from the one-time funds that the district has had accumulated. And we'll talk about that a little bit later, but those will be coming out of the district one-time funds that were, were being held. So uh, we will provide those, those dollars for the campuses. So um, I think I, I answered the question that Marcus has asked. The second question that we had received was from- Fred, I'm sorry, can I jump in a bit on the contingency question as well? Sure. I'd like to take us back to building the new resource allocation model one of the components of that model that we were trying to incorporate in as far as this contingency is concerned was any potential costs that might be coming up that were not built into the model itself. So position costs are built as of a point in time, but medical costs is another component that comes after the fact. And we were aware that in this new model, each center would also be required to absorb or find a way to pay for potential medical cost increase that are coming down the line as well. So the contingency was estimated at a number, knowing that um, whatever settlements happened and whatever medical costs did occur or might in have increased, that it would help to absorb some of those costs. While if it goes over the amount that we've set aside as contingency, each center would be required to cover that out of their own carryover funds. So it's not just a combination of just uh, the potential of a settlement happening for United faculty, but there were other costs also that we were trying to build into the model. Thank you. So, so the bottom line on that is that we did set aside dollars to cover the increase as well as we have the dollars to cover the off schedule portion of it. We do believe that we have the dollars moving forward when those go for the entire year. And really when we looked at the model, the old model versus the new model, when we were looking forward, we did think there was uh, some dollars that hadn't been allocated yet. So we thought we have the dollars to, to cover that. So um, kind of moving on to the second question, uh, Gil Contreras has asked, given the, the student center funding formula, are we looking to review or update the budget process? Uh, what helpful planning steps are we considering to retool and capture more funds? So this has been, uh, this model has been, has been rolled out for, for a couple of years now. And this model that we have and talking about today incorporates the new student center funding, funding, student center funding formula, the details, and we're not providing you all of the details for every one of the metrics because it's quite complex. In our budget document, we do go through that information. Uh, we are meeting in, in terms of, and it's coordinated by our, our educational vice chancellor in terms of pulling together a work groups from across the district to make sure the MIS data that we're capturing is the most accurate and, and the most beneficial in terms of the effects on the, uh, the, the new student center funding formula. Cashew will talk about those in, in details um, in terms of the categories, not so much all of the metrics, but the, the kind of coming, coming forward. So Gil, I guess the answer to that question is we have incorporated the as, all the aspects of the, the student center funding formula into this, to this model. What we are finding is that while we incorporate anything that we know about, there still continues to be changes within the, within the model coming from Sacramento. So we have to be a little bit nimble and be able to make adjustments to the model as those things come from, from Sacramento. Have we built in costs for potential settlements with other employee groups? And so we have not met with other employee groups at this point in time. But whatever we do, we will have a plan to fund those. And so, um, Mark, that's the best answer I could give you at that. I don't know what those amounts will be. It needs, I think we will be scheduling or Irma will be scheduling those meetings with the different groups to, to start discussion. I do believe they're currently in negotiations with CSEA that has not been settled at this point in time, but the offer that we have on the table, we do have fun funded. And so um, there'll be a lot more discussion on that. So go ahead and can you get me back to slide 17 to where we left off? 
kind of talking about the state funding formula. So I've been with the district uh, over 26 years. And so I've seen a couple of funding formulas come, come through. Uh, when I started, we were actually going through program-based funding. And that, in that regard, there was different categories that we would be funded, funded for. We would get something for m and we'd get something for students, we'd get something for FTES. Um, we kind of abandoned that formula because it was determined that it was too difficult to explain to the legislators. Uh, the thing that was the most interesting to me about that program-based funding, funding formula was that you go through all the calculation and then you get to the end and they, they would discount that by 50%. And it was, it was all different for different districts. So we were considered a low revenue district because our number was, much, was lower than, than a lot of the other districts. And so we went away from that funding formula. I don't remember the year and went to SB 361, which was more um, equalization across the, across the state, even though there were a number of districts that still received more per FTES than other districts. I think there were eight districts that were continuing to receive a hot, higher dollar amount. And then you had the, the, the community supported or basic aid districts. But we went to that formula, which was very simple, I think, to explain. It was all FTES based, and it was you had different rates for credit, non-credit, and CDCP. And so now we actually our new funding formula, which is kind of back closer to I think to that to the program-based funding formula, is very very complex. And just going through the calculations and trying to predict what the numbers are going to be, because a lot of the numbers we may not have even have ourselves, and the numbers change as you see the information that Cashew is going to be presenting, you can kind of see why it's so difficult because they use multiple years and averaging and it's gotten extremely complex. But just kind of a summarized version of this is we have FTES, the base allocation, which also includes the component for individual campuses. Uh, we also have a supplemental allocation, which is 20% and uh, student success uh, metrics of, of 10%. And so, um, the model is, is pretty pretty complicated. And we'll kind of go through and have Cashew and kind of talk about the details and as questions come up, we'll try to answer some of those questions related to the to the details. So Cashew, why don't you wow everybody with the knowledge on the on kind of the details of the uh, the allocation? Okay. Thanks, Fred. So let's take a look at the um, different components of the current formula, the SCIF. So first there's the base allocation. Uh, which comprises 70% of the student-centered funding formula. This is the part most like the prior SB361 formula that Fred just mentioned. There's a basic allocation, which um, is provided to each college and center based on its student population. And there are allocations that are provided based on different FTES, such as credit, non-credit, CDCP. And Fred mentioned that the SCIF was more complex. Definitely, each of these elements uses a different data set, uh, different source and calculates the information in different ways and has different rates applied to it. And I've provided the recurrent rates here. If um, you are looking at how things might impact us in terms of FTS changes, the credit portion has now become an average. So the impact of our FTS targets that we're setting for the new year get incorporated into that the credit FTS, the changes will have a slower impact than they would on non-credit because the credit FTS, as I said, mentions it includes a three-year average. And if you're interested in looking at this information, it's coming from the Chancellor's website. All the budget information that the state provides is available on the Chancellor's website. And I've provided the information on the link here at the bottom so you can see if you wanted to grab this information or any other more updated stuff, it's also available for anyone at any time. So here are the, um, the information and the data that's used to calculate the supplemental allocation. And that's 20%, and it is the component that targets equity of access and opportunity for low-income students. So that's built into here as well. The success allocation is 10% of the SCIF. It targets and incentivizes successful outcomes of California community college students and focuses on the eight metrics that are listed here and even goes past a student's time in college to whether they attained a living wage post-education. 
So by the SCIF calculations, our anticipated earned revenue for the current fiscal year is $204.7 million. Our funding by component, as you can see, it aligns roughly with how the state's funding is set aside for the SCIF. And the, of course, the ratios that we get are impacted by our student um, that we serve and our student data. Here's a summary of how the SCIF calculation um, pans out for our college as well. The calculation of the allocation of those revenues by campus is included in the budget book. So if you would pull up the budget book, it's on page 48, but here's a summary of it. And still, as I mentioned, the majority of our funding is coming from the base or the FTS portion, about 72.7%. And our internal allocation model, the resource allocation model, first tries to take all of the SCIF revenue and align it by the different centers. We, we are actually using it and saying, well, if each center earned it as if it was a standalone entity, how much would they be credited with? But as a district, we are only provided credit for each student that we serve and each success metric that we have. So if, a, if each college might have served them separately and gotten credit separately, we would have to adjust down for what would be considered a duplicate count. So that adjustment's made so that we can get to an earned calculation that the district's actually gonna be getting. And so we take these and other state and local revenues and then we get the total revenues earned at each of the sites and we contribute a portion in our resource allocation model to the district services um, budget center to create the four different budget centers. And the expenditures that each budget center then uses to um, set their budgets are broken out. Primarily you'll see that we have 84% of our budget is in personnel. It's still in personnel in the old model. It's still in personnel in this model. These are direct personnel costs. Um, they exclude the personnel related expenses that are in the district wide bucket, um, which like the largest of that would be retiree benefits, which is at like $5.7 million. So in the budget book, we've shown, I wanted to point out that in the budget book, we have shown about 88% as the personnel cost, but that's just at the budget centers. This is district wide. And this was before the settlement with United Faculty. So these numbers. Correct. This is what the proposed budget information um, is showing. And the model, as I mentioned, also includes, or didn't mention the model also includes some components for transfers that a budget center might have to make to supplement its own programs. Since at the bottom, it's a zero sum game. If they don't have enough revenue, they have to supplement with their own programs and costs, as well as if there's any chargebacks uh, that are made between budget centers for costs. Like if one budget center provides services that directly benefit another, like custodial services or utilities, then, um, one of the other budget centers has to cover their own costs. So that's a charge back between budget centers. So that's basically an overview of our current um, resource allocation model that we are using. But we're, this is the first year of implementation. So there's still things that we're working through. Some of the things we're still kind of going through is what happens if there's a deficit at the state level and what happens if campuses don't uh, generate the numbers that we kind of predict at the beginning when we're building the budget. And so right now we do have hold harmless dollars and we'll talk about that in just a minute that we can be able to absorb this, but when those hold harmless dollars uh, no longer exist, then this is gonna, I think, create a little bit of a challenge for the campuses. And so we'll have to figure out how we're doing this, going to be doing this in, into, the, into the future. One thing that we're actually doing, and this is on the agenda for the CBF meeting that's next uh, Monday is kind of going, how do we go through and evaluate the model and how do we make improvements to the model? So that's actually on the agenda for uh, CBF on, on Monday. And as we go through, we'll, we're gonna be finding lots of things that don't quite fit into the model or we have not taken into consideration all of the aspects. So this is gonna be kind of a work in process, but I do think it's good timing in terms of the rollout of the model, because we do have a couple more years of hold, the hold harmless funding to be able to help us get through all of that. So let's go kind of get to the next section and talk about things outside of the RAMs, because I do wanna talk a little bit more about the, um, the hold harmless funds. Next slide, Keshu. So the whole harmless dollars, um, 
let me just talk a little bit about that. There's a lot of discussions and we are very fortunate to be receiving hold harmless dollars, but just for a little bit of background, in 2016, we shifted 2100 and I think 40 FTES from 2017, 18 back into 2016, 17. So we have kind of artificially increased our FTES for, for that year. And we did that for the reason of being able to capture some growth, get fully funded, and kind of extend our uh, stability year an extra an extra year. Um, so it was it was a, a, I think a very smart decision to do at that particular time. Uh, so 17, 18, when our enrollments, because we really were only reporting a fall and spring term with no summer, that our went, enrollments went down. We were guaranteed the rates that we were given for 16, 17. And what, what happened from that is when they rolled out the new funding formula at the state level, they've actually been giving us that higher amount that we were receiving in 16, 17 for the last uh, number of years. To date, actually through the end of um, 1920, um, we received about $40 million, 20, uh, $40 million of through the end of June 30th, uh, 2020, 2020. And we think we're gonna probably receive another $40 million when the, um, the hold harmless are scheduled to go through 23, 24. Right now we're predicting the dollars will be about $10 million a year, but that was based upon the FTES numbers that we were generating. We are seeing a significant decline in terms of our FTES. Fall was down overall about seven, almost 8% and the spring numbers are pretty um, pretty far behind our previous year numbers. We hope that they, that they catch up, but the numbers that were reported to me um, actually yesterday is I think the Fullerton College was down 17% from spring to spring reporting at the same time. And I think Cypress College was down 14%. So that will impact the amount of hold harmless dollars. While we're on the topic of hold harmless, Marcus Wilson also asked another question. Will campuses be held harmless by the district as long as the district is held harmless by the state? I think that is the plan at this point. Oh, one of the things that we will be talking about at the uh, Council on Budget and Facilities is what to do with those hold harmless, do hold harmless dollars. Right now, we've been putting them in to uh, one-time funding, and we've been having discussions at every CBF and every DCC meeting. So for, for at least on the short term, while there is the hold harmless dollars, the intent is that if the campus campuses don't generate those numbers or there is a deficit, there will be dollars to be able to, to backfill. We think it, it, in terms of our budget model that we put together for the proposed budget, that was about $10 million. $10 million. So we do think we have monies at least for the next couple of years, but that is the, one of the outstanding issues is how we deal with that issue moving when the hold harmless dollars no longer exist. Fred, so, can I share a little bit more about the resource allocation model sure. and the hold harmless, the use of the hold harmless dollars? Um, I'd like to just go back a few slides to talk, to just show the summary of our model itself. When we look at the resource allocation model, it's a zero sum game. So the revenues that we're receiving from the state and local revenues that we have we're budgeting to that number. And if our revenues fall short, one of the components of the revenues is our earned allocation, our earned apportionment. So we are budgeting to what we expect would be a reasonable ongoing estimate from the state. So the hold harmless is not supposed to be an ongoing um, component of our budget. We do have a component of our resource allocation model that allows for us to supplement from the hold harmless um, if let's say the state uh, suddenly takes our earned apportionment and applies a deficit factor to it and that takes us out of a balanced situation. We, are, um, we do have a component built into the model that holds that harmless. What it doesn't do is it our model does not incorporate in expenditures that then go beyond the model itself. So while we may have hold harmless funds, the discussion doesn't necessarily take all the hold harmless money and apply it to our model automatically. If somebody makes a decision like I'm gonna spend, you know, a whole bunch of money on something that doesn't necessarily translate into the model. Does that make sense in terms of what the component of bringing the hold harmless into the model, it's driven by a specific reason. 
And, and I think one of the other things is, if you remember when we brought the tentative budget to the board, the tentative budget, we were expecting about a 10% reduction coming from the state, and we were gonna be covering the deficit with those uh, hold harmless dollars. Kind of moving forward, there is concerns about the future budgets with COVID going on and what, what uh, is gonna happen related to community college financing. So far right now, knock on wood, we're hearing that we, we might be able to expect kind of a, a status quo budget, so no reductions. My fear is that, that we're gonna see reductions. Uh, we're actually hoping for this next year that they're able to buy down the, the, the um, deferrals over that because there are some additional revenues that are coming in more than projections. So um, we're very fortunate to have those hold harmless dollars. And as Cash, you mentioned that there, it would figure into the planning depending upon what happens at the state level. So Marcus said, thank you very much about being uh, the summer shift, the smartest vice chancellor. I, I did wanna just kind of talk about that. That was a shared decision that we had made. I know I had discussions with uh, Rod Garcia about that. And I was, I was actually surprised when I did the calculations for that first year. And that first year, we thought it was going to bring us in about, I think if I remember right, it was about $7 million extra. But we thought the following year it would, could be about another $11 million. So we originally thought the, the, that shift was going to bring in $18 uh, million. We did go through, after discussion with the chancellor, go through all of the governance groups. And, and thankfully, the governance group supported the decision to kind of shift those FTES. Uh, so there was lots of dialogue and discussion on that. And then we were very fortunate that they put in the whole harmless for the rollout of the new resource allocation model. So that was actually just pure luck, Marcus, on that on that kind of kind of part related to the next several years. Just happened to be in the right place at the right at the right time. So other items outside of the RAMs uh, are the categorical funds, which are budgeted the same way we've always budgeted them. Cashew uh, will talk about that more. Uh, the carryover funds, which is a component of our ending balance, Cashew will talk about that. And then some of the other funds outside uh, of the, the district's uh, general fund. So Cashew, you, you wanna talk a little bit about the grants? Of course. So the, uh, those other funds that we talked about are just part of our district budget, but just outside of the RAM. And as part of our general fund, we also have um, aside from the funds that we just talked about, we also have the restricted portion, which is the grants. So this year we've started with the estimated budgets of our grants were about 71.8 million. And this list here is just part of the list that makes up um, the grants, but these are the majority of the funding that we received. And as you can see, the state continues to provide large amounts of funding towards student success and also strong workforce development. And this year, as a result of the pandemic, we've received funding related to that. And those funds like the CARES fund and different funds related to that are varied in purpose. And the final component of our general fund is what we may call the carryover funds or our ending fund balance. So some of these funds are not generally spendable like the non-spendable balance, which includes inventory items, the restricted fund balance for specific funds like parking and health services and restricted lottery, um, and funds committed by board action, which in our case is to help offset the impact of future PERS and SERS rate increases. And the remaining funds, they've been assigned to purposes like the one-time funds or set aside to meet the board policy contingency or they are unallocated. So in the prior year we had, our ending fund balance was 102.4 million and the current year balance was 93.6 million. So obviously there have been costs that have come through that have hit those um, fund balances, those carryovers. So we are kind of talking about those ending balance. We, we are expecting those numbers to come down. Uh, we do know that we're already spending dollars. We're going to the board Tuesday night uh, with the settlement with the United Faculty. So we'll be spending some of those dollars that were in the ending balance that we had accumulated because we didn't give salary increases in in 1819 and 1920 in the first half of 2021 to, to the faculty. So they'll be pulling down some of those, some of those numbers. Um, in addition, we've lost quite a bit of dollars related to not having in-class instruction. They were projecting the numbers of about $5 million a semester. So we've already allocated $5 million to the campuses to backfill for those lost uh, funds. And we've projecting that for the spring term is going to be another 5 million. So we do 
expect the numbers will start to come down from here. Um, what's not included in, in these numbers is kind of the hold harmless for the next couple, couple of years. It's not included, but we kind of, this is this point in time as of June 30th. That's all I've got on that, Keshu. Okay. And then lastly, in terms of our proposed budget are our other funds. So we also consider the budgets for construction related activity like the bond funds or the capital outlay funds. Um, we also do have self-insurance funds, the district self-insured for things like workers comp, property and liability, and the retiree benefits fund, which is used to hold funds prior to being transferred to our trust, as well as some campus-based activity that's budgeted as well. And again, um, more information on all the district's funds and the information put together for that are available in the proposed budget book. It's available at our district website online. So from here, we're actually gonna kind of stop for a minute and, and ask for any questions that we've had on that, on the actual resource allocation model. Before we get into Fullerton College allocation process, we we did kind of a lot till we wanted to be starting with Fullerton College at, till, at 3.20. So we got a couple of minutes. Do we have any questions that want, anybody wants to put forward? Or if I didn't thoroughly answer somebody's question previously, you can ask kind of a follow-up question. Everybody's an expert. Okay. Questions coming about the non-resident tuition. When we get to February, we'll actually be receiving information from the state chancellor's office in terms of the, the rate increase. So we will be doing a calculation. It's really based on the prior year's expended expenditures for current cost of education. So until we do those calculations, we don't know what the numbers will be. As part of the non-resident tuition uh, amounts, there's two components. There's the, there's the FTES or the, you know, the, it, per unit cost, which is based upon the prior year, but there's also a capital outlay component. I would suspect that when we do the calculations for the capital outlay component, that the number will probably increase pretty dramatically with the amount of expenditures that we've had related to the, in the bond building fund. So I think we're gonna have to limit, and I think we've limited it in the past in terms of the total calculations. So we, it may stay consistent, but we won't really have an answer to that, Rena, until we actually do the calculations. Uh, there's several choices that we have on that to, to kind of use our calculated rates. We'll get the statewide average as well as our contiguous districts. You want, since Cashew, you do that calculation, do you want to add anything on that? Oh. No, you know, I'll type in an answer um, related to how the non resident tuition is calculated but it is done um, based on information that's received and taken to the board. So it, while I understand and appreciate the frustration of the people who work on the catalog at this time of year and try to set up for the next calendar year or the next academic year, um, it's, we don't have that information at this time from the state. So we don't have it to provide to you as well, but um, we will put our recommendation forth based on our own costs, as well as what we're seeing from the state and surrounding districts and propose a recommendation to the board. Um, just so you're aware, one of the things that underlies the non-resident tuition costs is not just what we wanna charge our students, we're also required by um, ed code and um, other regulations to charge our non-resident students a cost that covers things because they're not residents. So we do have the obligation to look at our costs and provide an approximate estimation of what fee would be charged to non-residents that would cover these costs that the state is covering for our resident students. We got a couple more questions before we move on. There was a question from Alexander Brown. Can you discuss how non-resident uh, tuitions are allocated across district or campus budgets? And those dollars are actually the other revenues that the campus brings in while Cash, you primarily talked about the apportionment. There's other local revenues that the campuses include. Those are included if they're earned over at Fullerton College, the, the students are going 
to Fullerton, the money stays at Fullerton. If it's at Cypress, it's at Cypress. So the district, we take no dollars from the non-resident tuition anymore. We used to take the first million dollars to kind of go into the old allocation model, but now all the dollars related to the non-resident tuition stay with the, with the campuses that actually earn the non-resident tuition. Um, another, another question was, uh, will remote instruction be included or become a permanent factor in the FTES uh, student funding formula moving forward? Uh, we're not sure exactly, I think, where this is going with the FTES. There was a, com a component or, the, or an allowance made by the state chancellor's office through legislation that recognizes the fact that we're going to be losing FTES because of the, um, the, the COVID issue. And we were able to elect, and we did elect to, to use a prior year number, I think it was our prior year P1 number, as our reported FTES. So we, we utilized that last year. So even though that we had a decline in FTES, we were able to capture additional revenue. That same election uh, applies for this for this year, at least it did for the fall, fall term. And so we've elected that. So we're not, while we're seeing the large decline in FTES at, at, at this point, for one, the first kind of um, component is where we shouldn't experience a lot, a big decrease in the funding formula for the earned portion because of that election that we made to use a prior year number for FTES. Kind of moving forward, we're not sure exactly where that's going to, to go. Um, but as long as we're able to capture that, we, we will uh, do that in terms of using a, a higher number for us. Kind of the secondary thing that kind of helps us is that we do have the whole harmless monies. And so we were about $10 million over. So it would take a pretty significant decrease, but kind of the, the number, uh, we're, we're actually there in terms of, I think when we projected what the cost of the, of the fall enrollment at, at about the 8%, we thought it was gonna be about $13 million. Although because it goes over a three year period, it, you just take a third of that. But while it's harder, slower to go down, it's also slower to, to, to recoup as well. So we think we're okay as, as long as this is just a temporary issue and spike in our FTES, but we're not, I know that there's some discussion um, up in Sacramento related to FTES, especially on the non-credit side. So uh, we'll have to take a wait and see. Keshu, you're a little more, uh, stay a little more in touch on that since you do the 320, or you, you have anything to add there? Um, were you were you uh, answering the distance? The rem I was looking at the remote instruction. Remote instruction. The remote instruction. Yeah. Okay, so what I have seen is, and I think Janeth, you might be talking about how NOCE had really a lot of changes in the way the state looked at non-credit remote instruction because usually most of NOCE's uh, course offerings are in person. And the credit institutions, they did have in place ways for them to be able to calculate or convert their classes from on-site to distance education, but NOCE, I think, didn't. And so the emergency provisions that were in place, the state was really generous in terms of how they allowed the districts to transition very quickly from being live and on site to having to basically not allow students to participate in on site instruction. And those emergency um, provisions will not continue to sustain. So I think they've been working on trying to change the way that we look at non credit, especially, um, or and even other classes that are usually only on site those then become a part of how the state allows you to submit your FTES calculations. So distance ed is already a part of how credit institutions do calculate their FTES. And I think that that's the same for trying to transition in what traditional um, on-site classes have been, trying to figure out how do you uh, calculate that. And that will then become something that if approved um, is another methodology that would be available to you, not just on an emergency basis, but it would have to be approved as an ongoing method. That's an approved way of that course instruction. So we we're, need to kind of move on to, to Fullerton College and we'll, if we have time left over at the end, we can kind of come back to any questions. So Rod, if you want to kind of take it for Fullerton College's allocation process. Sure. Uh, good, good evening, everybody. Uh, if you can go to the next slide, please. 
So as Fred and Keshi have talked about it, obviously the most important part of our budget is uh, being able to accurately uh, project what our revenues are gonna be. Um, that's a little, that's easier said than done. Uh, a lot of the times, like I said, although the funding model has gone away from fully funding based on FTS, as you saw, FTS is still a significant part of our revenue. So basically what we do at the campus, we kind of mirror the district's philosophy as far as trying to estimate what we think our budgets are gonna be, what we try to project what our FTSs are gonna be. And as you saw, it's not on a year to year basis anymore. It's on a three year average. So, and another thing that we need to consider as well is, you know, how did we do the previous year? Uh, a lot of times what people don't understand is that when we close our fiscal books on June 30th, we really don't know how we settle that year until the following February, January, February, if we're lucky. So normally we don't know what we, the revenues we received from the previous year till about eight months into the current year. So that kind of hurts a bit as well. But uh, using the three-year average model will help us as far as um, any significant decrease. It'll hurt a bit if we're in a um, increasing mode. But um, so basically what we do is we try to estimate what our revenues are. Then we start the development uh, process beginning with the college executive team. And like I said, we analyze the budget based on really there's two significant buckets that we're talking about, ongoing and one-time funds. So as um, we at the district and at the campus, we don't do zero basis funding, which means we start with zero every year. We carry over what our existing budget is that includes our personnel and primarily most of our operating allocation. Uh, when we talk about ongoing funds, usually that is a significant portion of our ongoing funds that have already been allocated before we get the funds. So really, as you saw uh, in the previous slides when we're talking about contingencies, this year, based on the new resource allocation model that we uh, used and uh, knowing that um, one of the breaking news had not uh, settled in several years, we set out uh, a bigger contingency than we normally do. Normally our contingencies are a lot lower than that. So when we're talking about ongoing funds, we're not really talking about too many available funds on an ongoing basis to really discuss unless we are in a growing pattern. So when if we would be growing, then there would be additional funds ongoing that we would be discussing and going through our planning process, which I'll, I'll explain how that works. And then as far as one-time funds, basically what that means is we analyze what our carryover amount is. And then once we have that number, once we close the books, we basically go through a lot of different categories. There are certain things that every year we fund with carryover funds, like we have a technology plan, which we allocate $500,000 a year for computer replacements and things of that nature. There was a question earlier, you know, what do we do with the non-resident tuition funds? Uh, the way that we budgeted at Fullerton College is actually, uh, we set the money aside. We don't allocate it that year we carry the amount as a carryover amount, and then we um, basically allocate the following year. Um, and one of the major components that we fund is our international student um, area. And the reason we do that is because uh, the non-resident tuition uh, revenues are sometimes kind of volatile to, to determine what to expect what they are. So like for instance, in this time period, we, I think in the last, within a year and a half, we lost about a million dollars worth of non-resident tuition. So that's not something you wanna budget on an ongoing basis uh, because if you have such big swings, then it's kind of hard to cut. So what we do is we set it aside and we allocate it the following year. Um, so going through the process, as you can see here, like I said, we. Uh, we look at a priority based on fiscal year performance. We do take consideration of our current and future fiscal environment, uh, local and state. So a lot of it is state driven. Once we start looking at our ongoing funds, we, we do look at our campus master plan priorities, not only for our ongoing funds, but also our one-time funds. 
program review recommendations are also taken into consideration. That's another thing that we do with our one-time funds is we go through a planning process, review our program review uh, recommendations, and then set aside what available funds we have to fund uh, as many of those um, recommendations as we can. Um, so all these recommendations go through several different uh, governing uh, bodies on our campus. If you could go to the next slide, please. So the two governing uh, bodies is uh, Planning and Budget Steering Committee and the President's Advisory Council. So basically, as you can see here, when we're developing the budget, it's not really a, a one-time thing where we analyze, develop, take to these two committees and we're done. I wish it was that simple. But as you saw the timeline from Cashew's uh, the earlier slides, it's the, the state budget is basically being developed from January all the way to through June when it actually is enacted. So through, during that time, we have uh, our PBSC uh, committees and our PAC committees meet twice a month, each of them. So through that process, any information that we get from uh, the, for instance, the January budget, all the information we get from January to the May revise, and finally when it's approved, all that, all those updates and the planning process go through these two uh, committees uh, on a monthly basis. So uh, all the information is shared, all the recommendations share, and that gives the opportunity for these committees as well as the different divisions um, to be able to participate in seeing what is happening with the development as well as help steer in some of the different issues that we have on campus. I think that's the last slide. So once we, uh, once we take the final budget and I report out to these two committees, then basically we go to the district-wide committees, which is CBF and DCC, and then Finally, we go to the board for, for approval. I don't know if there's any questions before we get on NOC. I, I haven't seen anything in the chat, but it's it's not a real complex. Um, the, the model is complex. Uh, the way we go about it and uh, look at it and review it, it's not really complex on the, at the campus. Like I said, since a lot of it, especially the ongoing funds, are already carryover funds and are already budgeted. You know, we're really working with carryover funds or any growth that we might be able to achieve. Thank you, Rod. So now we'll kind of go over to Terry Cox. Do you want to present on uh, NOCE's allocation process? Yes. Good afternoon, everyone. So I'm Terry Cox, the Director of Admin Services for NOCE. Next slide. So NOCE's budget process. Um, so NOCE's institutional mission and goals are the foundation for our financial planning and budget development. Um, we also um, consider, take into consideration um, NOCE, the strategic plan, the district master planning priorities, and then we also have our regional adult education consortium goals that help drive us for our planning. And in addition, we do take into consideration the current and future fiscal environments at the local and state levels. Next slide. So under the direction of the president, the planning process considers the needs of students, available resources from multiple funding streams and personnel costs. And so similar to Fullerton, we also have um, two primary shared governance committees um, and they're tasked with making decisions on fiscal planning and resource allocation. And that's our president's cabinet and our budget committee. The budget committee also, um, well, the budget committee, so they coordinate and approve a priority list for classified and management positions for new positions that come forward um, that impact our current year fund. And we also review and approve requests for one-time funding, um, such as uh, supplies and instructional equipment. And then the Academic Senate representatives, they join um, the executive team in determining the priority list for um, any new faculty positions. 
Next slide. And so the current year fund, which is the 11200, um, because that's our ongoing revenue, supports the majority um, of our ongoing expenses. So um, that funding source covers our salary and benefits for permanent positions and adjunct faculty, the department operating budgets, reserves for personnel contingencies. And then if there is any budget left, um, we um, reserve it for um, other needs. And then if there, if there aren't any additional funds, then that's when we tap into our carryover fund. So as um, for myself, as the Director of Admin Services, I do work closely throughout the year with President Staff, Program Managers, and the region, Regional Consortium um, for Adult Ed, um, our Director, to monitor expenses and to ensure that we're um, in compliance of the regulations. So we do have a couple of minutes before we move over to Cypress. If there's any questions related to NOCE's um, allocation process. I'm not seeing any questions. So Alex. Uh, good afternoon, folks. Uh, thank you for allowing me some time to kind of talk about Cypress College's allocation process. And we'll just jump to the next slide. Um, I think what you'll be seeing here from both Rod and Terry and myself is a lot of commonality in terms of the approaches. And so you may not see something that's too uh, different from what you've seen already from these two fine folks ahead of me. Um, uh, again, at Cyprus, we do break our budget down into two main components, one being the operational base budget, uh, which we actually have on a two-year cycle at Cyprus, meaning that uh, if you're allocated a budget in one year, you actually have two years to spend it. Um, and that kind of goes back to what Rod was saying before, that carryover effect. And it's each year at the base budget is rolled over from year to year. So um, that allows us to use a two-year budget cycle for the operational budgets we do allocate. And those budgets do consist from Cypress's perspective. It consists of the general fund, the lottery, and self-support revenues. Um, the general fund and lottery are pretty self-descriptive. And the self-support revenues are those funds that are derived from material lab fees or other fees that a department may charge or that we generate independently from those other allocations just to help support operations. Um, the other piece is the one-time funds allocation. We do that on an annual process. Um, that of course is depending on fund availability. Um, we actually have started to use program review as a basis uh, for our evaluation process and for uh, prioritization of one-time funds if they are available. We'll go to the next slide, please. So when it comes to the operational base budget, um, like uh, uh, both uh, uh, Rod and Terry from their respective uh, locations, we use the executive team as the beginning point. Um, but with that also comes consultation and review of other priorities and plans across the district, whether it's our, our strategic plans or our college shared governance groups and our resource groups. And of course, uh, consideration to our current fiscal climate. Uh, Rod went into a, a pretty uh, detailed discussion about that. And we kind of follow that same mirror. We look at a number of factors that uh, influence our budget, whether it's uh, current enrollment targets and or pressures from uh, pending obligations that are, are current at the time or things that we anticipate in future years. Um, so all of those play a factor in our current fiscal climate. Uh, for example, we spent a lot of time going through our extended day budgets to make sure we have plenty of money set aside to fund those activities. We, we review in our enrollment projections to see where we are and where we intend to be. Um, and as uh, Rob mentioned too, having that three year um, a review of our FTS numbers, it, it will help uh, kind of uh, shorten the blows of a, a steep decline, but it also won't allow us to re result the, uh, the net increases have a quick uh, increase also. So it is a double-edged sword in, in that regard. Um, with that in mind, we, we take all these things into consideration and the executive team meets and we basically communicate the, uh, the priorities to the management team and let them know these are the things that we're seeing. We review the anticipated or our preliminary budget numbers with them and review that with them. We usually do that um, early in the year. Um, at that time, we ask them to begin to prepare their budget submissions. Um, they go back and they meet with their teams, whether in their departments, whether it's uh, uh, their classified staff or hopefully with their department coordinators and their faculty to review their budgets to see what they need. And they, we ask them to submit a budget request to us um, each year in March. Um, from there, we go through another review process with the team and that continues through April. Uh, with the goal of, of having our tentative budget set and in place by May. If you remember back to Cashew's presentation, she had, at the very beginning, she had a timeline um, uh, as to when all these different items are due from the district level. And as you can see, we try to match up with that to have our information ready to go for those uh, deadlines with the district. 
Again, with final budget approved by the Board of Trustees, we uh, get all of that squared away and we begin our communication process and roll out uh, with that to the shared governance group, usually in September um, under normal circumstances. With that in mind, we also do three department budget updates and check-ins throughout the year. Um, usually um, at the release of the final budget in September, we meet with each of the individual departments um, and we go over their budgets with them and we review uh, some of the things that we've seen in prior year expenditures and, and uh, basically an outlook is what we see for the rest of the year. We do a mid-year check-in usually around between January and February. And finally, uh, in April, we kind of do a target to see where we're going to land for the end of the fiscal year so we can get dialed in to what we expect our balances to be uh, towards year end. Next slide, please. Um, the next item we'll talk about is our one-time funds or that allocation process. Again, uh, we identify a pool as to what we see available and similar to what they do over at Fullerton, we look at our carry forward balances and any of the, our, our current fiscal climate, to see if we can release funds. Uh, as for example, uh, in not this current fiscal year, but last fiscal year, we released about a million dollars in one-time funds to the, to the college in order to uh, fund one-time funding uh, opportunities and needs. Um, but this year, we, we don't have a funding pool available in anticipation of, of, of um, uh, funding commitments we have uh, for this year and for the, for the future years. Um, again, oh, we work with our planning and budget committee as our main body that evaluates these. Uh, so they go through a process of, of uh, creating um, a, a rubric or a metric in order to review the requests um, and uh, the priorities that have been identified. Um, we also uh, refer these items up to the president's advisory cabinet and then on to the present for final approval. Again, some of the timelines associated with that is that basically at, at the beginning or the first semester of our meeting together as, as PBC, we basically work through uh, with consultation with the, the budget message that we received in terms of the, the priorities for the college and or the district. We fold all those items in, and then we look at our program review uh, uh, data and evidence to see what that is. And we use that to develop the, our uh, rubric and then make decisions and recommendations from there. Uh, the goal is um, any one year is to have PBC for those recommendations over to our to PAC um, by April and hopefully to have all of those items approved um, and reviewed by PAC and the president with allocation in May. Uh, that again is similar to what Fullerton does in terms of identifying a pool of funds and then over the course of the year evaluating them and then actually allocating them at the end of that fiscal year. Um, and that, in a very quick nutshell, is our allocation process at Cyprus. I'd be happy to take any questions. I peeking over at the q and I don't see any there, um, but I wanted to take any if there are. Thank you, Alex. I'm not seeing any questions either. So we'll kind of move over to the district services allocation process. Um, kind of next slide, Cashew. So with this new allocation model, because we're not a, a budget center that actually earns from FTES or any of the other components, uh, we've received a 9.25% of the resource allocation model to fund district services. And so uh, these five categories are really uh, under the vice chancellor and or the uh, director of public, public affairs as kind of the leads in, in these, uh, these areas. And within each one of these areas, we, we break down in terms of, I'll just give mine finance and facilities, for example, we break down our budgets in public, probably into like 10 different categories. So we have one for payroll, one for purchasing, one for accounting, one for my office. And so depending upon how we want to track all of the expenditures is how we set up all of our budgets. So that's done for each one of the departments with under district services. So what we did um, this year, can you go to the next slide? Is we actually took, and, and I worked on this this year because Keshu was working on other things related to the, the new resource allocation model. So I would kind of was put in charge of the district services process. So we took all the positions and that's kind of where, you, where we always start is we know we have certain positions that we have to fund. And then, you know, Rod had talked about most areas don't do zero based fund uh, budgeting. We kind of really did go back and kind of start and take a look at every expenditure that we had and kind of reevaluated and what the numbers should be. So anything that where we had expenditures for contracted services, we were required to produce 
and be familiar with whatever contract that was and go to the chancellor and have to justify every expenditure that we put in our budget this year. So we did do that for each of the areas to go to go through. And you know what, what we did is to, to talk really talked about uh, in district services meetings uh, with the, the chancellor and, and the vice chancellors and, and the other managers uh, that report to the chancellor. Uh, we, we talked about what were realistic budgets and what uh, we needed to live within. And so uh, we kind of really pushed and, and cut budgets to where we thought we were actually had the dollars sufficient to, to, to do operations without a lot of uh, cushion. Uh, there are some, certainly we have some contingencies built in, but all of our budget centers are expected to live within those. And if we don't, then we have to go to the chancellor and she is controlling the additional dollars that we had as it relates to district services. So um, hopefully we'll see a more streamlined uh, budgeting process in terms of being able to control expenditures. As part of that whole process, we did take a look at some of the areas where we were commingling district-wide expenses and campus or district services budgets. And we have, I think, have done a better job of actually separating those two for, and I think a good example is the churning fees where we were seeing things going into the district-wide bucket that really should be in a department budget. So we kind of broke those out and actually allocated district um, services uh, attorney budgets for HR, for finance and facility, and actually including the chancellor as, as well. So um, that's kind of the process that we use for district services uh, this year. So we'll kind of see how we, we did in terms of trying to match up expenditures with uh, kind of the uh, planned expenditures. So I just see a couple of uh, questions that were coming up. So Kim is asking, uh, will a process be established to reevaluate the 9.25% allocation each year? I don't know that if it will be done each year, but I think it is one of the components that will come up as we do the evaluation overall. Again, that's probably a topic that will come up at CBF when we go through the allocation process. But one comment related to the 9.25% when we came up with that amount we actually did a survey of, uh, it was more of an in, informal survey, but with the multi, other multi-campus districts throughout uh, uh, mostly Southern California. And um, our number, if, even at the 9.25% is significantly lower than any of the other uh, multi-campus districts. It goes all the way up to Peralta doing 24.61%. Uh, so we are significantly below, and I think we did share that information to uh, CBF, and we'll be prepared to share it again. But it is a good question, something that needs to be uh, evaluated. We'll have to see how we actually do on expenditures and in terms of overall. Uh, one of the things that's a little bit difficult uh, for district services is being able to really quantify expenditures, and especially here at the Anaheim campus. Because of COVID, we're not getting a full full regular year to kind of know what the numbers are actually going to be. So it, it may be, may not be every year, but it is something that I'm sure there'll be uh, more discussion on. So Kim asked, where is their current process in place? Uh, we will have that discussion, Kim, on CBF, which you're a member of, and have a discussion in terms of the evaluation of not just the, the amount uh, given to district services, but as the, the whole model in, in O overall, so we'll see what comes up on on uh, um, next Monday. Fred, I'd also like to add that the resource allocation model itself involves being able to be responsive to uh, the structure and what's happening throughout our district. So that 9.25% was presented, calculated, supported at the time that we started this model and we will look at the end of the year, see what's happening. And as we see things structurally change or as decisions need to change, that model itself incorporates some of those changes as a possibility. So that is, it's definitely a model that has fluidity to it and responsiveness to it. So Dale, Dale asked, Dale Craig asked a question about 
will the mandated cost such as child, child care supplement be part of the district services budget? And so that's a, I'm not sure exactly what he's referring to for child care supplement, but we do receive about a million dollars of mandated costs. And those mandated costs don't actually come to di district services directly. Those have been allocated on the proportionate basis of the overall allocation model to the, uh, the campuses. So um, not only is the mandated cost dollars, but other dollars like interest incomes that used to be part of more of the district services budget, those dollars are actually allocated to the campuses as well as part of, as part of the other revenue. So nearly all of the revenues that come to the district have now been parceled out to the campuses. So other than the, the, the 9.25% of, of the resource allocation model, dollars that, that district services might own, earn specifically related to a grant uh, or other contract that they, that they work with will come directly to district services. All of the other dollars are going directly to the, to the campuses on a proportionate basis. So uh, does that answer that question uh, for okay. you? Fred, I can also speak to, to, I think, the funding that's being board mandated by the, for the child care funds is related to possibly the $250,000 that we supplement up to 250 that is supplemented to provide child care center funding at Fullerton College. And I think that was um, put in place per board action back in 2009. Every year, the um, board does allow for the district to provide funding to supplement any shortfalls to keep the child care center at Fullerton College going. But the supplement is only up to 250. After that, Fullerton College supplements the rest of the costs for the child care center's ongoing operations. And that is part of now in our, in our resource allocation model, it's not considered a district services cost, it's considered a district wide shared cost. So it is in that component that each of the four budget centers will now be contributing toward covering those costs. Any other questions before we move to the last part in terms of how to stay connected? Well, let's go to, to how to stay connected, Keshu, and why don't you uh, kind of present information there. Sure, absolutely. If you're interested in looking at information related to the budget, if you ever have a question about, you know, where did this information come from or how do I get involved, there are various different um, events and activities that happen throughout the year and you're welcome to participate in them at any point in time or not participate in them if you don't feel like joining today, but you do tomorrow. We of course have the budget allocation handbook, which is being revised, but it, it, we, the current I think the current one, the old one reflected how our process worked within the previous model. The new one will show what our resource allocation model information was similar to today's presentation. Also the Council on Budget and Facilities is an open meeting. Um, you can also check with your representatives of your constituency groups or your campuses to see if they can share out the information, which they do from the Council on Budget and Facilities discussions. Each campus has planning and budget committees, as you are probably familiar with on your campuses, but if you weren't aware of how to reach them, now you have three faces that you can contact and say, where's my budget committee conversation? Um, the board and the chancellor used to do coffees. I think they still will plan to continue that where you have an opportunity to talk to them and ask questions um, about the district as well as budget information and developments. And we do present information on a regular basis at the Board of Trustee meetings. There is really good information at the Board of Trustee meetings um, if you stick with it. So past all of the initial information that comes out, um, there is much conversation about events that are happening or decisions that are being made on your campus um, as well as district wide. And there are other group meetings by the different constituency groups. So you have associate students, joint academic senates, classified senates, and additional other groups as well. And of course, if you wanted to know, okay, well, that's fine for the district. How is the statewide information going out? What's happening to the system? What's happening to the state economy information? 
the chancellor's office, our system-wide chancellor's office does have a website at on their webpage that includes budget information, updates, analysis. They share information that they get very readily out on that website and it's available to anyone at any time. And just a couple of comments on that, on the, the district's budget allocation handbook, we are expecting to have a draft before CBF in at the February meeting. So we are working on that. And then kind of on that last item on that budget news, this is the same information that all of us budget officers get from uh, the set Sacramento in terms of you can get the same information real time that, that we're getting the information. And, and you know I have taken this uh, link to CVF and to DCC to let people know you can get the same information that we're getting and building our budgets off of from this information. Not only can you get the information for our district, you can get it for the other 71 districts as, as well. So I think it is a wealth of information for anybody that's really interested in knowing more about the community college uh, finance. And then I think kind of the last thing, if uh, you have any questions, I think we've uh, and I've been more than receptive to taking any questions from people if they send them to me and or Cashew, we'd be, be happy to answer any questions as, as they come come up. So we're, exci we're excited to talk about the budget and kind of our budget, the state budget. Uh, I'm not sure everybody else shares the same enthusiasm, but if, if you, you, you have that enthusiasm, just, just uh, email us. We'll, we'll be happy to carry on a conversation. So that's kind of bringing us close to the end of the time that we have. We got a couple more minutes. So are there any additional questions that uh, we might have? Or is there anything else the panelists would like to add? Don't everybody type it once. Okay, I'm not seeing any additional questions co coming up. Uh, I would encourage you to attend a CBF meeting if you haven't attended one in the past, because we do cover a lot of the different topics. And we do talk, been talking a lot about, you know, kind of what dollars that we have available in terms of one-time funding. Uh, because of the hold harmless monies that we had previously accumulated and some other things that we have done, we accumulated quite a sizable uh, sum in terms of one-time resources that we had although we're now starting to see it uh, kind of be reduced with kind of backfilling for the campus dollars for doing salary setups, but we will be going over the detail where we think we are at Monday's CBF meeting. So we have a pretty packed C uh, CBF mon uh, meeting on Monday. It might be an interesting one to attend if you, if you uh, have the time. It's, two, it's at two o'clock on, um, on Monday, so. Otherwise, thank you very much. And again, if, if you, you uh, want to pass the information along to any of your friends or colleague or torment them, um, you can certainly uh, go to our website and you'll be able to see the inform same information again. So uh, I don't know if anybody would want to watch it twice, but maybe if somebody didn't watch it, they uh, might be interested. So again, thank you very, very much. All right, I think, now what? We don't know what to do at the end, now since this is a webinar. Oh, here's, wait a minute, we got a couple more. Just a couple, thank you, thank you, thank you. Leslie, do you, do you know what we're supposed to do next? Wait, you're on, you're on mute, Leslie. We're supposed to smile. What are we supposed to do? <laughs> we can end it. Okay, let's. If it. no one has any other questions. Yeah, we're right at. Okay. So, again, thanks everybody again. Thank you, panelists.